Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Stephanie Meyer and I am the Senior Practice Leader for Immunization Programs at the BC Centre for Disease Control. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our second session today, New Approaches to Immunization Communication. To begin the session, I will provide a brief introduction to vaccine hesitancy and introduce our speakers who will present two oral presentations. This will be followed by a question and answer discussion with the panel. I encourage you to submit questions on Slido and upvote questions that you feel are important. So what is vaccine hesitancy? Well, simply put, vaccine hesitancy is a term used to describe a refusal or delay in vaccination due to concerns about immunization. However, as we all know, dealing with vaccine hesitancy is anything but simple. It is a complex issue with multiple determinants. The World Health Organization outlines three key factors associated with vaccine hesitancy, known as the 3C model, including confidence, the trust in the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, complacency, the perception that the risk of vaccine preventable diseases is low and that vaccines are not necessary, and convenience, the extent to which vaccines are available and accessible. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been proposed that two additional C's exist, including communication, which recognizes that the world is also fighting an infodemic of a few facts mixed with fear, speculation, and rumor, which has been amplified through technology and social media platforms. And secondly, context, which acknowledges ethnicity, religion, and socioeconomic status. Our next speakers will focus on factors that contribute to vaccine hesitancy, as well as innovative strategies to combat misinformation and improve communication with clients. In tomorrow afternoon's session, vaccine hesitancy will be further discussed and include a presentation on the updated immunization communication tool as a framework for communication. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for this session. Takuro Ishikawa from the BC Behavioral Insights Group will be presenting on learnings from behavioral science, followed by Craig Thompson, Lily Christ, and Takuda Shioto from the Public Health Agency of British Columbia, who will pre be presenting on the immunization infodemic and an innovative BC approach to combat misinformation. I will now hand it over to Tak for his presentation. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to start the presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, can you please confirm that you're able to listen, hear me, and also see the screen? Someone? Thank you. Uh, so, um, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the learnings from behavioral science, uh, specifically a little bit about risk perception and vaccine confidence, which is one of the elements of vaccine hesitancy. Um, very quickly, I just want to go through the disclosures. I basically have no financial relationship with any um, sponsors related to the, the information I'm going to present. Um, I have not received any financial support for this uh, research program, um, and there are no potential conflicts of, of interest to um, report as a result. Uh, in terms of mitigating potential biases, um, but we have, there's no nothing arising from conflict of interest, but I do want to point out that the information presented here today is more like a literal review from behavioral sciences as it relates or can be applied to the, um, the problem of um, vaccine hesitancy. Um, to, to us, the main, um, behavioral scientists, the main uh, disclosure here is that uh, this information and these findings need to be replicated uh, by any person or entity that is willing to apply uh, these ideas um, in the realm of immunization and vaccine communication or vaccine hesitancy. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that I'm joining this meeting from the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Slate Wet Truth, um, Muskiam, and Squabby Nations. I am really grateful to be able to live, work, and play here in these lands. And we acknowledge that the ancestral connection of the specific territories of indigenous peoples in BC. Um, so, without further ado, um, Let's start with this presentation. Here is a couple of uh, advertisement pieces from two local food companies um, that, as you can see, have gone, um, they try to advertise themselves as 
health food or healthy or, or industries in the health um, and wellness uh, sector. And they have gone uh, a little bit out of their way to uh, specify that their products have been uh, basically avoid ingredients that they can you cannot pronounce. Or in the other, on the right hand side of the screen, they emphasize that all the ingredients included in these products are uh, ingredients that you can pronounce, which is an interesting um, way of advertising healthy products and makes you wonder if it's what, what is it about the, the ability to pronounce ingredients that makes it better or, or potentially healthy, or at least uh, create a perception that this is healthy. Is it just because people are not familiar with ingredients is because people want to know what's in them or is it actually the the ability to pronounce the word so here comes uh, behavioral science and this is a study that was conducted a few years ago where basically they took two uh, product uh, product items or food items and then um, in those um, and they listed the ingredients in these two uh, food items one of them had the ingredient called magnaloxate totally made up uh, ingredient food ingredient and the other uh, food product was uh, had an ingredient called like hermagritrum something that kind of harder to pronounce. Both of them are kind of unknown and completely made up. So people are unfamiliar with these ingredients. So they basically randomized um, these two uh, product uh, items and they ask people different questions about what they think about this food. Um, the interesting thing is that the one food item that had nigrogen or vipritrum or whatever was considered to be more risky, potentially unhealthy. And this tells a lot about how risk perception kind of works. And this is the type of research that I want to present today um, from the behavioral sciences. The behavioral sciences have been around for almost two, um, four decades now, and we have provided a lot of important, important findings about how humans or individuals think and make decisions. In, and in these 40 years of research, we have produced a lot of findings that we collectively uh, group into what we call behavioral insights. The most important one or central to this idea is, or the central finding or insight is the fact that we uh, humans tend to have two different systems when we make decisions or try to solve problems. This is down to a research done by Daniel Kahneman and his collaborators over the, the many years. System one is what we call thinking fast and is the type of system that is automatic, intuitive, relies on emotions and instincts, uses mental shortcuts, and is usually effortless. Uh, we can think of system one as the part of our brains that help us survive in the plains back in the early days of humankind to avoid being eaten by uh, tigers with long uh, teeth. System two is what we call like this low thinking system, which is the rational part that relies on logic, is analytic, is effortful. We have to actually put ourselves into it. Uh, is self-aware, evaluative, and reflective. And we can think of it as a system that, as Dr. Boniferi mentioned this morning, allow us to create all these amazing vaccines with viral vectors, um, also created, um, developed um, calculus and biostatistics. That's system two. The main important uh, contribution of behavioral sciences to the world of the public health in general and uh, potentially for vaccine or immunization is the fact that most people often operate in system one. And sometimes in the realm of public health, we sometimes assume that people are operating in system two, but no. Normally, most people use system one to make most of the everyday, to, uh, everyday decisions, including those related to health and parenting. So behavioral insights have produced all these plethora of findings, literally hundreds of them, that we can use and tap into to apply and to, first of all, to understand how people understand and perceive vaccines or perceive the risk of vaccines, but also how we can better communicate and promote um, vaccine uptake. So let's start with one of them. I don't really have time for a lot, so I'm just going to give a few very, very quick examples. So this is the news that I read back in November of 2020. And as you can see, it was when they presented the idea of mRNA technologies applied to uh, vaccines for coronaviruses uh, for, for the, for the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, I remember when I read it, I was super excited, right? Oh, wow, we're using mRNA technology 
this is new technology, this is great. Basically, they, what they did was to encode in a, in a piece of mRNA, the spike protein, and they added a transmembrane domain, so it basically anchors in the epithelial cells. Like, I was super excited, this is great. But that was my system to, my system to thinking, oh, I'm reading through this information. One of the things that is important to understand is that system one doesn't like that. System one is very, very apprehensive of things about things that are unfamiliar, that are new, that are less known, that are difficult to understand. Especially if those systems have unclear benefits. Sometimes if they have this, uh, those uh, new technologies of risk are distributed unequitably in the population or if they are perceived to have delayed effects. So this is down to decades of research conducted by mostly the leader of this is Paul Slovic, who has been um, doing a lot of work on risk perception. And again, this idea of risk perception may affect vaccine confidence. Another element that influences respect safe perception when we think about system one is the idea of morality. So in this particular study that I'm going to describe, um, they basically took a situation in which a child was, was left alone to play for a few hours. And the researchers basically did, um, presented the same situation to different groups of people, only they changed the age of the child and also they changed the reasons the, the parent decided to leave the child alone as well as the gender of the parent. Um, so in what, what is interesting in this study is that if the parent left the child alone uh, for work or to volunteer in a charity, that situation was perceived as less risky compared to a situation where the parent left the child alone because uh, he or she was having or they were having an affair. So morality is also intrinsically related with people's perception of risk. So risk really for system one is a mix of a lot of different things that have nothing to do with evidence, nothing to do with science, and they may affect the way people face or the confidence that people may have in vaccines. How would that happen? Well, imagine that you're going through the web and you find this report by Oxfam, the Oxfam, the Canadian charity, in indicating that pharmaceutical companies are reaping immoral profits from COVID vaccines. So again, morality may influence the perception of risk. And if someone reads this, that may uh, decrease vaccine, uh, conf people's uh, confidence in vaccines. Other elements that may influence confidence in vaccines, but also ultimately more directly affect or influence vaccine hesitancy is for some that we call the omission bias. A tendency of people to prefer harm that is caused by inaction over equal or lesser harm caused by action. So this is down to the, the idea that people also try to avoid regrets uh, and try to make decisions that prevent them from having a, a feeling regret later on. So uh, one, of, one of these examples is when uh, talking to a, a, a friend of mine who's a parent who was just taking her, uh, um, when we saw, she saw that the kid uh, experienced some uh, mild side effects, it's like having a, a child's um, having, maybe going through a hard time or having a bad time, even if it's mild, uh, it's easier to accept when it's something that you didn't do that was something that you actually did. Or, or that your child is going through a fever or having a little bit of pain because of something you did. So that's kind of the idea of omission bias. And that's why people sometimes have the preference for maybe not doing nothing. And this is something that uh, has been uh, also um, studied by the Public Health Agency of Canada, our colleagues here, behavioral scientists there, who actually have um, collected some evidence that looks that seem, um, uh, seems to confirm or best evidence in favor of the idea that omission bias is, uh, is playing a role in the acceptance of um, vaccines for children. Next is uh, the idea of uh, risk attitudes is particularly when it comes to parenting. So I just wanted to you to look at this picture that a friend of mine took downtown uh, Vancouver. Uh, yeah, there's a, a mother riding the bicycle with a kid. The mother is not wearing a helmet and the child is. <laughs> uh, 
And you might find that this is kind of weird or, a, or at the very least inconsistent behavior on the part of the, of the parent, but actually for system one logic, it makes sense. And the reason is because um, parents tend to be more risk averse when it comes to making decisions about their children, particularly when it comes to health related decisions. So, and you probably, um, maybe you have talked to some parents who, who were making the decision about vaccinating their child. Some of them, at least in my case, would be saying something like, for me, it's a no-brainer, I can just take it, I'll take the vaccine. For my child, I need to think a little bit, uh, I think we need to be more careful and I want to think a little bit more and I want to read more. And this is basically the idea uh, of how parents' decision-making is a little bit different uh, than for the general population. Another finding that is interesting is that parents tend to be insensitive to the degrees of risk. So even if the risk is low, they act as if they see risk in categorical terms, is zero or something. And so they, so to, to communicate sometimes the, the risk of vaccines, oh, the risk is minimal. They may not be, be seen as, as very small that you see like some risk and it's not zero. And finally, um, the other element that um, uh, behavioral sciences have uh, given us regarding uh, parental decision-making is the fact that they look to social norms, they look to other peers and what is expected of them as parents in order to make decisions about the children's health. Uh, I can speak a lot more to that if um, but I don't really have much time, um, but yeah, welcome questions about that portion of parents. So this is how we basically think that it, um, this, um, uh, attitudes towards risk among parents would affect vaccine uptake for children. As you can see, I think you probably saw this uh, uh, graph earlier today. Um, kind of like we anticipate is that is uh, for vaccine for children, the uptake is going to be slower than it was uh, or it has been for adults. So as you can see here in the purple line uh, on the right hand uh, lower side, that's uh, an uptake for children. This is the percentage uptake over the past uh, year um, year since um, since the vaccines were um, the past few months and as you can see for adults the curve is steeper uh, but for children kind of plateau earlier than in most in, in the cases of adults so we will see in the future um, talking about what we can anticipate for later I think uh, we can we maybe uh, will be seen as lower uptake of vaccines for children and uh, so as a, in summary, few learnings that I want to emphasize here. One is the idea that conflicts between experts and lay people when it comes to um, acceptability of a new technology and the risk of new technology are, is often down to differences in risk perception, not differences about what risk is acceptable or not. The other important lesson is that perceived risk of vaccines is shaped by many factors that are unrelated to science and evidence. And most of it is because uh, the perception of risk speaks system one language. So you want to communicate vaccines and want to people to understand vaccines uh, more effectively. We just want to learn the system one language and communicate uh, in those terms. And again, emphasizing that anything that we're talking about here has not been uh, specifically tested. So we need to do more research on specifically how this elements that affect risk perception influence specific uh, vaccines or COVID-19 vaccines. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. And over to you, Steph. Presentation, I will now hand it over to Craig Thompson, Lily, and Takuto for their next presentation. Can I be heard just to... Jack? Hi, Craig, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll begin. Uh, hi, I'm Craig Thompson, and this is the Immunization Infodemic, an innovative BC approach. Um, we have to be super quick. Uh, if, if there's anything you'd like to know more about, please feel free to contact us. Uh, my contact information will be provided at the end of the presentation. We have divided this presentation into three parts, and I'll be giving you a quick overview of who the players are in BC, um, and, and really a tip of the iceberg highlight of misinformation. Uh, I cannot avoid mentioning COVID, just 
and this is to start off from the beginning comment. Uh, Lily will continue with a deeper focus on misinformation leading to TAC, who will discuss the innovative direction we are heading towards in BC. So let's begin. Next slide, please. Um, so yes, we have nothing to disclose and uh, we don't have any financial relationships. Uh, there are no conflicts of interest with us, although we are keen on the idea of having financial relationships. I, I want to be honest here about that. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, about the Public Health Association. So PHABC, uh, I need to acknowledge Shannon Turner, who is the Executive Director of PHABC and of course their board. Um, both have supported KBI going international and have been a tremendous support uh, for our program. So, uh, you know, I, I really have to give them a, a thumbs up. Uh, please visit the PHABC website and see what's going on. Feel free to send your comments and suggestions. Uh, and while you're visiting, consider supporting the Public Health Association by joining. Um, PHABC is funded to support the promotion of BC's immunization programs, including the flu. This includes uh, Immunize BC, iBoost Immunity, Kids Boost Immunity, both English and French, and our recently launched Club Boost. Uh, and more to come as you will soon learn. Uh, BC uses a unique model in delivering immunization, health promotion services uh, in particular. So because PHABC is external uh, from government, we have a lot more freedom to develop and explore. We have the ability to learn and to acquire wisdom which is difficult for typical government programs, you know, and that's because related to elections, associated risk management issues, and fiscal calendars. This, is, this allows us to be nimble. So while PHEBC receives an annual budget from the ministry, we can also seek funds from other public sources. But most importantly, we can approach private companies and foundations for funding too. Next slide. So um, another big player, uh, the IPWG reports to the BC Immunization Committee. Um, they also have a formalized agreement with PHABC and the ministry through annual reports. Uh, past accomplish accomplishments include establishing uh, the Immunize BC brand website, the flu clinic locator, Kids Boost, iBoost Immunity. Um, they're also an active participant in the upcoming BSRR education program. Um, and uh, the, the IPWG is a silent leader in immunization promotion and advocacy and serves as an excellent model for merging health knowledge and innovative communication strategies. Next slide. Uh, Immunize BC has evolved from BC's immunization uh, strategic framework that came out in 2007. Um, it, it has evolved into a brand, a website, and, and now an entity. As you can see, Immunize BC has a diverse workforce, which is vastly different from other government health promotion groups. This mixture of backgrounds has added to new perspective and reaching difficult population. And it has to be a real driving force in making, and I mean really making, uh, I see a different ways of doing business. And I, I'm a true believer in this cross-pollination approach in driving innovation and change. And this is an example with the work we do at Immunize BC and KBI. Uh, next slide. So if you go on social media, it's a hell storm. Okay, I'm not gonna be polite or mince words about it. There is no other way to describe it. But let's keep this simple. Um, I want to behold you uh, with some controversial words in the English language currently going. Uh, misinformation in particular has, uh, has become hyper-political, hyper-provocative. The years of Wakelin or Jenny McCarthy, tales of woe are nothing what we are experiencing now. I need to point a couple of things out though, okay? So I looked um, two of these words up in, in an old fashioned dictionary and with paper, uh, and uh, they didn't exactly match up the definition. So it's interesting, information was similar to uh, the definition that I have up here now, uh, except that now if you look on various pages, it's defined as coming from credible or trusted sources. Um, that's been added. Uh, misinformation definition is also includes parts of disinformation now. It, it, it's becoming blended. So really the words disinformation and misinformation are interchangeable, although you predominantly see uh, misinformation used. 
And then, of course, when you get a whole mess of misinformation all at once, you get infodemic, which is really just a lot of misinformation all at once, uh, which includes components of this disinformation. Next slide. So there's not much to say here that will be a surprise to anyone. Um, you know, th there there is predictability uh, right up to COVID. I think we were slowly gaining confidence in, in how we were approaching misinformation. Uh, we did have misinformation around uh, amongst healthcare workers, but it was fairly benign. I mean, mainly with flu. Um, I'm sure there was some rumbling with alternative healthcare providers, but at the same time, we had some big steps forward, in particular with midwives and natural paths. Uh, and I think today still unmatched in the rest of the country, even today. Next slide. And then blam pandemic. So misinformation times 100, the infodemic was born. But as you can see, some very stark differences. We find ourselves now at odds with other public health agencies, other jurisdictions, countries. What were once fundamentally natural allies have become agents that require caution, suspect spreaders of misinformation. This has added a whole level of chaos that we are still struggling to handle. Uh, lots of moving, changing information, or is it misinformation and no information across multiple jurisdictions, compounding and building? I think this leads us safely to where we are presently uh, without following down the rabbit holes that uh, are, are sure to come. So next slide. So uh, people will naturally fill in their own information on critical matter matters when authority fails to provide all information. And I do mean all information, as we've noted. Uh, people will begin to fill in the gaps and ring-a-ling-ling -ling misinformation is born. Uh, are we surprised by the upsurge to the point of an infodemic? Uh, some are, but they shouldn't. Uh, should we be surprised that people seek answers and that they might have an alternative point of view? Absolutely not. But we didn't before COVID, but something has changed. And I think we can all agree. You know, if you look at the media, including voices of authority, and the, the response has become very harsh. Without going into specifics, we need to manage the situation as we always have managed it with compassion and respect. There is a real opportunity out there. And it is key that we seek answers from these groups, I think, moving forward. These are golden opportunities to learn and find out how skeptics have arrived with their decisions and then you know, address them head on. So a reflective moment for you. Um, you know, ask yourselves, and if you want to type in your responses in the chat, I'll be curious to look what you have to say. But have you tried to understand more about people's refusal or hesitation towards vaccines? How much efforts have we actually done personally as, as healthcare professionals? Next slide. So it's true there is no universal policy or plan to address misinformation in the healthcare sector, at least at a federal level. Um, there, as health, they, um, as health, health is a provincial matter, addressing misinformation is a provincial matter. Um, with, even with the best of intentions, each jurisdiction is doing its own thing. Is this bad? Yes, it is for the public. It's confusing, and it's an old age problem of wanting to be treated the same as others. I think that's what we're seeing now as other jurisdictions have different uh, rollouts of opening up. And is it, uh, and can we say it's bad for public health? Well, it certainly is confusing, and it certainly is uh, difficult to explain. Uh, should we be surprised? Yes, but really, no. I mean, this is a really a unique situation that we're in now. Uh, the best we can do is to continue to close gaps and look for opportunities. And that's my segue for announcing that uh, coming this spring, uh, PHAC is funding a new FPT committee, which is a, a federal provincial territory committee, for clarifying that, to address policy and health promotion issues at a national level. And one of the starting uh, goals of the group is to focus specifically on infodemic and misinformation at a national level. Uh, so it's a first attempt to harmonize how we communicate. Um, PHABC, me, uh, and uh, the Canadian Public Health Association will be co-chairing this committee. Next slide. 
So um, I'm running out of time. So quickly, public health are dynamos with facts and, and we struggle to adapt to compete to our techno audience. We, we need to update our thinking and correct myths. The anti-vax are, are not uneducated like some have uh, stated in the past. Uh, contrary to belief, they are highly educated. A recent US study fun, found that most anti-vax are, are hesitant and actually have a graduate degree. Uh, we need to understand or re-examine who we are trying to reach. We need to talk to them and we need to learn, adapt and change. Next slide. So uh, in transition to Lily's section, I am uh, stealing a, a meme or a mem, a quote, I just still don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, we cannot force someone to hear a message they are not ready to receive, but we must never underestimate the power of planting a seed. Uh, this sets up the, our new VSRR immunization education certificate program. It's our proposed approach at uh, planting a seed rather than banging the drum louder. Uh, we want to step back and engage with the anti-vaxxer to understand them better to begin a dialogue. And in this process, maybe we'll have enough information to prevent misinformation and help reduce the epidemic. And next slide and over to Lily. Thanks. Thank you. So what has been done before? How we develop policies around immunization? Our research was based on a review of past and recent health policies around immunization in Canada, North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Some of the conclusions around vaccination, refusal, or hesitation put the emphasis on the lack of dialogue and communication to allow patients to express their opinions or concerns. Most policies were designed following a similar model. We can see a continuum from compulsory to um, encouragement as we see in Canada. Next. So we have many questions. Uh, how do you tell someone now what to do? And uh, telling someone what to do is not enough. Substantial evidence exists to show that the increasing people's knowledge, although important, is not sufficient to change behaviors. Communication from public health and health professionals needed to move beyond the knowledge deficit model to adopt the more efficient bi-directional approach. Listening to those for whom the message is intended is as important as developing the message that experts want to communicate. How do we communicate? What is the way to convey important information? These messages must be tailored to meet receivers' need. Although, the very hesitant messaging too strongly advocates vaccination might backfire to reinforce hesitancy that, rather than mitigate it. Compassion and dialogue, understanding and tailoring are key. Next. So here are some of the research that we looked at. Uh, misinformation has been identified as a major contributor to various continuous contemporary events ranging from election and referendums to the response to COVID-19 pandemic. Not only can belief in misinformation lead to poor judgments and decision-making, it also, it also exerts a lingering influence on people's reasoning after it had been corrected, an effect known as continued influence effect. Next. We can see in this uh, mischart misinformation chart flow, we can see how the cognitive, social, and effective factors can lead individuals to form or endorse misinformed views. Some of the information interventions suggested are like the preemptive debunking, pre-bunking, and the reactive debunking to reduce the effect of misinformation. We can also discuss the effectiveness of both preemptive pre-bunking and reactive debunking interventions to reduce the effect of misinformation, as well as implication for information in public health and in other fields. Thank you. To talk now. Next. It's called Embrace the Complexity of Misinformation, mostly because I think um, this is where the opportunity lies. And uh, here's some examples of why people are vaccine hesitant. Uh, and what we found, and I'm going to go through this really fast, is that when you look into this further, it really comes down to 
two types of misinformation out there um, when it comes to vaccine misinformation. Uh, one is factually incorrect misinformation, so something like ivermectin cures COVID. Uh, the second one is misinformation that erodes trust. So that's something like the CDC is hiding the real efficacy results of ivermectin. Um, and these matter because, well, one, well, I'll get to that later actually, so I'm trying to see how I can condense this. <laughs> um, and when we looked into that second type of misinformation, we found that it actually can be categorized into four different types, or four different pillars, we call them. Uh, so mistrust in government, conspiratorial thinking, distrust in vaccine science, and alternative in natural medicine as a vaccine replacement. So another way to think of this is if you're vaccine hesitant, you believe or you see the world in w at least one of these sort of pillars. Um, and so that comes to, so what do we do about that? Uh, so with type one, uh, it's a knowledge gap issue, right? So that's where I think the conventional um, interventions have worked. Um, but the problem with type two is that it erodes trust. So once they, it's a trust issue, um, you know, if you're trying to correct them, they don't trust what you're saying, there's nowhere to go. So interventions need to build trust. Obviously that's a really hard call and that's really hard to do. So with VSRR with that uh, Craig mentioned earlier, I'll just really briefly touch on it. Uh, Using those four pillars, we identified eight different types of vaccine hesitancy um, and how each one could, you know, we give different types of messaging for each one. This isn't the point of this presentation today, so I'm just going to skip that, but you're welcome to ask me about that later. Um, instead, today I want to talk about the preventive focus that I'm focusing on right now uh, and a couple sort of things that I wanted to keep in mind as, we, as I was working on this. And one is that uh, everyone is vulnerable. I think um, I don't really need to get into that too much. I think we've all seen that through the pandemic. Um, and then the cause of vulnerability uh, depends, it varies from individual to individual. And also what I'm vulnerable to is, depends on individual. So if uh, say a certain piece of misinformation I'm particularly vulnerable to uh, might not be the same one as someone else. Um, so why are clinical solutions not enough? So here are the four different solutions that are out there in terms of how we deal with misinformation. So one is present the facts. Uh, two is teach people how to check their sources. And three is teach people how to identify misinformation. And four is we say, hey, before you share things on social media, please pause. Now, there's a lot of research on why these don't quite work as well as we want. I think the main thing that I want to sort of touch on is that on paper, these work really well. The problem is that they're not realistic in that I think it's pretty clear that we don't check all our sources for everything we read ever, right? That's just not possible. So these solutions, as good as they are, they're not really realistic. Um, so the possible idea as a solution is um, solutions need to be reasonable, um, ad ideal adopting something that can be a simple habit, um, target people when they're most vulnerable to misinformation, specifically misinformation that erodes trust, um, and we focus on the four pillars, and we provide information that tailors to individuals' needs. Um, Ideally, there's a few more things, but I'll skip that for now. Uh, so what can we do? Um, what we can do is basically, what we thought about is um, how can we catch misinformation, especially the second type, before it becomes something that's ingrained and something that they start seeing the world through, right? Um, in other words, is there a marker for someone that says, hey, before you take this seriously, you need to check your sources, right? Is there something like that out there? And we found that there might actually be, and it's emotions. Um, so there's a lot of evidence for this. Um, emotions can influence attitudes and in how individuals process scientific issues and information. Um, emotions have a tendency to activate cognitive biases and so on and so forth. Again, I won't get into it too much, but the idea is that what if we ask people to sort of develop a habit where, hey, if you read something or see something, and you feel particularly strong about it, if you have an emotional reaction to it, then that's a really good time to check your sources. And this is something that actually could be trained. This is something we could teach. Um, and so we call this the emotional appraisal approach. Um, and I'll really quickly go through an example of what I'm thinking of what I will do as uh, my focus is on online communication. Um, so imagine this as a website. Um, so step one, we feed you a whole bunch of, uh, one at a time, um, different headlines that sort of mirror sort of these four pillars that I'm talking about. Um, and then step two, we get you to react with emojis. And I'm imagining it more like one of those live streams where you can react with more than one emoji. So you could be like, I want five angry faces with one sad face, right? Um, that kind of thing. And then step three, basically, we turn that into um, a personality quiz and say, hey, according to how you've reacted to these different headlines, we think that you might be most vulnerable to this kind of vaccine, vaccine misinformation. Um, 
and we'd give it a fancy name and we give it percentages. Um, this look basically was stolen from a Myers-Briggs thing. So it's not going to look like this specifically, but that's the concept. And um, then step four is sort of what I talked about earlier, which is then to teach them, hey, do what you just did, right? Um, imagine you're about to react with an emoji, which is something that people can do. Whereas if you ask them, hey, are you angry right now? That's a little bit of a tougher call to, for people to make. But if you ask them, hey, react to this with an emoji, that's something we all are used to. So um, basically try to ask them to, yeah, if you feel those things, if you react those ways, then try these methods, right? That's when you need to check your facts. That's when you need to check your sources, that kind of thing. Um, and so obviously there's still some limitations to this. Um, for certain audiences, this won't work, um, especially if you're already obviously ingrained. This is meant for people who aren't there yet. This is to prevent people from becoming vaccine hesitant or start going down that direction. Um, it's still at a hypothesis stage. Um, and let's see. But what I want to end with is that, um, so I briefly talked about VSRR and what we want to do in terms of what kind of communication we we're preparing for the extreme vaccine hesitant. And then right now I just talked about sort of what we can do with least vaccine hesitant, but still vulnerable because we're all vulnerable. But as you can see, everything else is an opportunity. And I think the opportunity exists because we don't need to find a one-stop solution for all of misinformation. All we need to, we need, just need to find different solutions for different audiences at different times of the vaccine hesitancy scale. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity, I think. And um, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much the presentation. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Tak, and thank you to our presenters. I'll move right into our question and answer session. And um, our first question may actually be for you, Tak, so I may get you to come back up. Um, the misinformation spreaders seem to have quick access to websites, videos, and articles. It's hard for the research base to combat that with key links. Is it worth the time since the conspiracy theorists already seem to have their minds made up? I'll pass that over to you. If you're oh, what's able. What's the first part of that question? Misinformation spreaders seem to have quick access uh, to websites, videos, and articles. It's hard for research base to combat that with key links. Is it worth the time since the conspiracy theorists already seem to have their minds made up? Uh, should I go up there? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, what do I think about that? Um, I think it's worth the time, but it really depends on, you, you kind of have to take the approach of, um, it really, again, thinking about different types of, types of information. W what I find is normally, um, you know, I, again, I didn't spend time on this, but the reason we came to those four pillars of misinformation is because um, a lot of misinformation, if you keep asking those questions, basically if you follow an online conversations and debates, it usually ends up with one of those things. It's like, I don't care what you say, I don't trust you because I don't trust vaccine science and the results. Or I don't trust it because I have some conspiracy theory reason for why that, what you're saying is wrong, right? So the idea is, if you can get to that point, then you can actually deal with the real issue in some way. So I think that's a potential solution. Um, but really, as I said earlier, there's no one size answer to this. So, you know, it really depends on the individual um, and where they're at. So yeah, that's my thoughts. Great, thanks, Tech. And uh, would anyone else like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, just very quickly. So yeah, in the end, it's, it's also about building trust. So as I mentioned, risk perception is also intrinsically related to things about fairness. So part of the problem with dealing with this type of misinformation is uh, one that we need to build trust so the sources of the information the correct information i believe the good news is that a lot of things that there's a lot of things that we can do to increase trust in the different entities by pro, for example providing uh, consistent messaging across different organizations from public health entities also providing uh, good advice if we're talking about clinicians here is like instead of trying to have a conversation about persuasive and these are the arguments just trying to understand where these hesitant people are standing um, and where they come from right whether or not it is worth to talk about the most entrenched anti-vax people there's a lot more going on than just facts and misinformation so again it's about all the things that governments can do 
that increase. So how do we respond to even like a flood? How, will, how do we even respond to other types? of how do we even present these uh, vaccines in terms of equity and access to uh, vaccines or all these elements that may increase the perception of, um, or may help the perception of risk by um, adding uh, more trust, equity, uh, and responding to like emotional uh, reactions of people. Great, thank you, Tak. And I'll put this question out to all of our panelists. Uh, I'm not sure who's the best to respond here. What are some practical ways to respond to vaccine information? Practical ways. Um, you know, that's, again, that's a really tough question. I, I think, again, it depends on who you're talking to and when you're talking to them and all that, right? There's no, again, no set answer. But I think, um, I'm assuming you mean vaccine misinformation that you see, or is this about vaccine misinformation that someone else is seeing that you're worried about? So, right, like that, that's a different answer, for example. So, um, but one thing to do is obviously not share all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing I think is um, what I do. So, for example, I read a lot of vaccine misinformation. I, I, I've signed up to about 12 anti-vax emails. Like, the amount of vaccine information I read is abnormal. Um, and so, you know, I, I think what I do when I read that stuff is have a sense of, oh, okay, so this is the sort of underlying reason. This is the kind of anger they have. Like, I almost, because the facts are pretty clear. But what I find interesting is sort of the personality and the emotions behind it. Like, what's what's the motivating feeling behind it? How are they feeling? You know, what kind of people are they? Right. That's the kind of questions I ask. And so, I think that has helped me in terms of finding um, different avenues of what to do in different situations. So again, I can't give a general answer to this, but I think looking at the problem slightly differently um, will, again, I think yield a lot of opportunity in the future. So that's what I would say. I think I, I would add, you know, building on what we've learned from the VSSR or VSRR is that, you know, it really depends on your who you're talking to. And, and you know, we have to take the time to find out what's their reasons uh, for hesitancy or being an anti-vax. And then, you you know, that's what we're developing with with our program is that we will then respond accordingly to where they're coming from. So it's not a one size it's all kind of approach, but it's one that has to be broken down to a more individual basis and, and understanding where they're coming from, I think, before we can really address it effectively. Um, yeah, just from the behavioral insights approach, um, one, one tool that we um, sometimes recommend people using is what we call the truth sandwich. Um, because the one thing that you want to avoid as much as possible is to repeat the misinformation because you risk uh, basically spreading more spreading or helping or amplifying um, the, the incorrect information. So the, the idea of the truth standards is that you can just start with something that is truthful, then you negate the misinformation, and then you end with something that is truthful. A good way to do it, or one advantage that we have, is that a lot of the misinformation has a kernel of truth. So, for example, uh, like like also mentioned, I used to uh, uh, join a lot of uh, channels of misinformation. One one particular um, element that came out at some point was the idea that the spike protein was uh, uh, toxic to the body because some research additionally the spike protein in the virus was causing the injuries in like a, um, a, a blood cells. So there is a kernel of truth that you can put in the middle. So you say, you know, the, the spike proteins um, created by the vaccines behave differently than the spike proteins in the, in, in the actual virus, which may cause this, and then you close again. But again, the, the, the vaccines are safe because the spike proteins are, um, are not going to go into blood cells or epithelial cells or cause the damage that, it, that the virus spike proteins do. So if you explain true truths and, and the misinformation in the middle, you're more likely to uh, combat. But again, this is no silver wallet. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our next question, um, and Lily, you touched on this in your presentation. Um, 
I am curious about thoughts on vaccine mandates and vaccine passports and their effect on changing behaviors as they relate to vaccine hesitancy. Well, um, I can briefly talk about this. Uh, uh, from what we have uh, researched, the, the dialogue, the importance of being able uh, to, to convey messages, but also to be able to receive messages from uh, parents or anyone that uh, is about to get vaccinated or would like to get vaccinated or is hesitant about vaccination. This dialogue has to be uh, helpful for everyone and very uh, important in, in the way we do it. So to be able to have a compassionate dialogue and to listen also to the people that we have in front of us, it's the beginning of hopefully uh, a different way, a different approach. I think Craig can also uh, answer this question better than I can from his health perspective. Thank you. Um, I, I, might, I might, but this would be one of those rabbit hole answers, I think. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, you know, what we, again, I'm going to reiterate, we need to listen to people um, and, and understand their perspectives. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I do see purposes and mandates uh, when you need to rapidly get people immunized. This is, you know, what part of your bag of tricks. Uh, but if we're really looking for the long-term solution, we need to really understand this population and their hesitancy. This is the only, you know, this is the only solution moving forward. Great, thank you. And uh, another question for the group, I'm not sure who's the best answer. How do people check their sources? How do they know what is true and what is false? I sort of, is that coming up? I can't. Uh, you can start, Craig. I, OK. Uh, I sort of address this, right? Uh, in normal world, uh, you know, Immunization, immunization information is fairly consistent, right? Uh, we, it didn't matter what jurisdiction you were, what, what part of the world you were in, you know, the, because of like networks like the vaccine safety net, you know, from the WHO, um, there was a real effort to make sure that the information we provided was consistent globally. Uh, you know, what, where it was really tested, of course, now is in a COVID world. And, and that's because, you know, information is changing rapidly. Different countries are, you know, different places in, in you know, rollout of vaccines or disease rates and coverage rates. Uh, so this is just like a huge influx of information that we're constantly dealing with. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what, where else I can add with that. Is the TAC, do you want to jump in at this point? Um, sure. Um, so I, I think um, that's a really good question in terms of how do you know, uh, especially because, like, like I said, I read a lot, and you know, some of it, there's an element of truth. Um, and so I think in my case, um, uh, well, you just know where to check your sources and also uh, know where your limitations are. And I think, that, I think that's protected me, given how much I read, um, knowing what I know and where I really don't know what I'm talking about. And I think that has protected me from sort of making assumptions about, you know, because most misinformation relies on basically people thinking they know more than they do and making people feel like they know more than they do. And the fact is, I just don't know anything about vaccines when it comes to it. Like, like I'm probably the least informed person in this room, right? Like, um, or in a normal room, I might be the most informed person. But And so just knowing that your personal limits that way, I think, um, and sort of knowing where to check your sources when your limits, when you hit your limits, I think that's sort of my key anyways. Yeah. Great, thanks. And we have time for one more question. Um, and I'll direct this question to Takuro to start. Um, I wonder if the perceived risk of disease in children was affected by initial findings of low death rates in children. That may have affected low initial vaccine uptake in children. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, uh, 100%. So one of the, um, the analysis that I'm planning to do, or at least I'm planning to do, is once we 
uh, or have a few months of a vaccine roller for children. They used to used to basically do longitudinal analysis and check, for example, Omicron would have been uh, a good indicator of a decrease in perception of the risk of the disease, right? So, so we we kind of and that kind of coincided with the rollout of vaccines for children. So we may be able to to see through those nuances because that is 100% correct. And on the general perception that kids are less affected uh, is is another factor. Um, what is interesting is that before the vaccines for children were, were released, Angus Reid um, uh, pro produced a survey that indicated that in general parents were actually pretty worried about the child getting uh, COVID-19. So, which kind of uh, ended up a, a, a little bit uh, being inconsistent with what we saw later to, later in, in this in vaccine uptake. But so yeah, 100% agree. There's a lot of factors that grow into play. Um, what potentially one is people parents tendency to be less uh, willing to take risks for their children. And we need to account for any, or any other potential influences on those decisions. Great, thank you. So that wraps up our Q&A uh, panel discussion. I wanna give a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. A lot of great learnings and pearls of information that we can take away with us. I'll now pass it over to Mary and Gunther to close our day. <laughs>